Welcome to the Willow Ridge Sermons Podcast. This is where you can find audio from Sunday morning messages and more. Make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss future episodes. And thanks for listening. Well, good morning. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to join me in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, Here in just a little bit, we'll start with verse uh, 24. Um, Well, uh, we are back from the beach. We had the opportunity this past week to to get away on vacation, um, and it was needed, and it was good uh, to be gone, uh, to be able to spend some time with Aaron and the kids and celebrate Aaron's birthday was wonderful. Um, I'm going to say probably, like for me, and and I know that this makes me sound um, o- o- older, uh, old, older, both of those. Uh, but I got to listen to some good books, right? Like that was an exciting day. I got to eat a lot of really good seafood. But here's the realization, and I don't know that I even uh, admitted this to my family, but they will probably be able to say that they recognize this about me, all right? I have now turned into a certain type of individual on the beach. Maybe you're this individual, maybe you're not this individual. I used to notice this individual on the beach and would pass judgment on them, maybe even laugh a little bit at them as I walked by with my bright red sunburnt shoulders. I am now under the tent with a shirt on guy. Like that's just a good spot to be, you know? It's like, I'm just here, I'm in the shade, I want to take a nap, that's who I am. But it was, it was good to be at the beach, uh, good to be back, good to be back along with you guys as we continue on uh, with our summer series this, uh, this morning. As we look at these stories that Jesus told called parables, that's what we see them in the Bible, they're, they're called parables. We, we think of them as, 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 these, as these, these stories that Jesus tells to, to prove a point, to teach something in these moments. Now, normally when Jesus tells these stories, when he, when he teaches these, these parables, he, he does so because something that someone said sparks a thought. Or even, and there's some occasions where someone thinks something, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, addresses it and, and does so in, in the form of, of a parable. But, but this parable this morning that we're going to look at, it, it's the, the parable of the wise and the, the foolish builder, the parable of the house built on the rock. It, it comes a little bit differently than someone has said something or someone has asked a question. You see, this parable Jesus tells, and he tells it at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is important that we understand this context in which Jesus tells this parable. One of the things that that is very important whenever we read our Bible is to understand uh, the context in which the passage that we're reading, uh, to, to understand where it's been set, what has led to this moment, and then even times what comes after this moment. So Jesus tells this parable as his last teaching point in the Sermon on the Mount, his longest sermon that we see recorded in in Scripture. And and when we see this, most of the time when Jesus teaches, Jesus teaches on like one topic or a couple of topics, but this one he's covered a wide range of topics. And if you'll just look down, these aren't on the screen, but if you just look down, you'll see the very end of it in Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29, it says this, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. So in this teaching time that Jesus has had with this group of people outside of the city, many have gathered to hear him. They recognize that not just what he is saying is powerful, But they recognize that the person who is teaching, that with his very words, he carries authority. And it's authority that's different than simple intellectual authority as what they would know with their scribes. 
that this authority of Jesus was different than anything that they were accustomed to. Now, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew 5 and goes all the way through here at the end of chapter 7. And there's, like I said, there's lots of topics that Jesus connects and threads through as he's doing this teaching. He begins by talking about the, the Beatitudes. If you know what the Beatitudes are, those are those blessed statements that Jesus gives as he defines what it means both in the context where he finds himself and in our context of what it truly means to be blessed and to be blessed by God. Jesus covers topics such as anger, lust, divorce, oaths in your word, retaliation. Jesus talks about giving. Jesus talks about praying. He talks about fasting. He talks about anxiety. Right, lots of topics that were very relevant then and still very relevant today. And there's other topics mixed in there. And then at the very end, and the last thing that Jesus is going to say to this crowd, he closes with this parable. And so let's look at it starting in verse 24, read through 27. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus begins and, and lets these people know the, the point of the story at the very beginning. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, Jesus establishes from the very beginning that there's some importance, there's value into knowing his expectation, to knowing his heart, to knowing these things that Jesus has just taught them and then put them into place. And the people have sat there probably for hours and they've listened. They've been intrigued. Their minds have been captured. But what Jesus makes very clear for them is that they're going to have to make a decision. When Jesus concludes, and they go back to their homes, they go back to their jobs, they go back to their families, they go back to their day to day, their routine of life, what are they going to do with that which they've just heard. Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and, and does them. These people have to make a decision of what their mind has heard and wrestled with. Is it going to change who they are? Is it going to change what they do? You and I, right, we make this decision all the time. We cut on the news one morning, and they say a new study found about whatever food you really, really like. And you know, like you're hoping, like they find, they are gonna tell us that like eating a candy bar every day is going to make me skinny, you know? Like, and then we hear the news report, and that food that we love, they tell us it's not good for us. They show us the science, they show us the evidence, they show us with people with abbreviations before and after their name that we know are smarter than we are. But yet you and I have to make a decision of what are we gonna do with this. Maybe it's not that complex. You're riding down the road. We were driving back from, from Beaufort yesterday. We like to stay off of the interstate. We like the small towns and the small roads. And there are those signs that come up every so often that say speed limit. And you got to make a choice. What are you going to do 
when you pass that sign? What are you going to do when you see the yellow sign with a curve that has the recommended speed at the bottom? Are you going to make the choice to obey, or are you going to do something different? You go to the doctor. You sit down with the doctor, and maybe your story is a lot like my story. You know, Bo, you need to start doing one, two, three, four, X, Y, Z, right? And I believe them that I need to, but I've got to make the choice, am I going to? Jesus sits down with this group of people, and he lays out a scenario before them that would have been common to them, a scenario that they would have been aware of. A scenario that they would have thought through. A scenario that many of them probably have faced. And he lays that out as the example of what you should do with the words that you've just heard from Jesus. He says there's two builders. There's not contracting companies, there's two builders. One builder is wise, one builder is foolish. I think it's interesting to, to note that when you read this and you understand the context in which it is read, that these individuals, the definition of who they are, and this is going to be important later, the definition of who they are is not solely based on what they've done, but what they've brought to the table as they've faced the situation. You see, what they will do will reveal who they truly are and who they've truly been. But you've got two builders, a wise builder and a foolish builder. The wise builder is going to build himself a house. The foolish builder is going to build himself a house. We're not given the, the details of the house. We're not given the specifics of the house. But for the most part, during the time of Christ, there was, the, there was a lot of similarity between the houses that were built. The difference that they do point out, we don't know how many rooms or the square footage, but the difference that we know is the foundation. You see, the wise builder built his house on the foundation of the rock, and the foolish builder built their, found, built their house on the foundation of sand. The wise on the rock, the foolish on the sand. So what would it have meant to, to work and to build your house on the rock? Well, it was a lot of hard work. See, when we think of desert and we think of sand, at least in my mind, oftentimes I think to places like I, like I was at the beach. We think of that deep, fluffy, white sand where you've got to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and the ground doesn't ever really get hard and you just keep digging. But that's not what we're dealing with here when we look at this part of the world and what the desert would be like. You see, their sand was not big mounds of sand dunes. Their sand would have been so hard, it would have been very similar to the tile floor that we have here in the auditorium. But to dig down to get to the rock of the, 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 that was there, the limestone that would have been there, would have taken a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of energy, a lot of expenses to dig down deep enough to get to the point to where your house could have this firm foundation that obviously would be needed in order for your house to stand. But it's a commitment. It's hard work. It's going to cost in order to build on that type of foundation. But the foolish built on the sand. Again, don't think of sand the way that we think of sand around here. Think of the tile floor that's beneath your feet. Oh, I mean, that's, that's pretty hard. It, it, it's solid. It seems like you can set a post on it, you can place a rock on it, and then lift up, and it's, it's not going anywhere. And you've watched someone else dig and dig and dig for days, for weeks, or for months in order to have one spot where they can set their foundation. 
and yet you're looking at where you're at, and you say, well, I don't have to spend that time, I don't have to spend that effort, I don't have to spend that money. It's not going to cost me, it's going to be easier for me if I just build my house here on this nice, good, hard sand. So one man digs down, one man doesn't. The man who digs is the wise man, the man who doesn't is the foolish. And then a storm comes, the storm comes. I think it's significant that there's two builders, there's two houses, there's one storm. Two individuals have built structures and will face the same circumstances now in their life. The Bible says that the rain fell. You know, we have the beauty of having our phones or like our, our, our meteorologists for us, right? Like we can cut on a radar on, on an app on our phone and, and see where the storm's coming. We can, we can get on uh, Facebook and, and follow like the South Carolina weatherman. Like he, he's a big deal, right? Like I don't know him. I want to know him. Um, like we can follow this. Like we can know. We, we got a pretty good idea. We were at the beach this past week, and Erin would constantly check back as for her garden back here and say, oh, good, it, it, it rained today, but it's not going to rain here, right? Like, <laughs> we're good on the beach and nice and dry, but it is pouring down rain in Lexington, so it's exactly what the Bradberries need, right? So we, we can see these things, but, but when the rain would come here, these storms would come over the mountains and very quickly. So in a moment's notice... You go from blue, clear skies to rain falling in bucket loads on you. But then it says that the floods came. And this is why it's important for us to understand the, 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 the ground also that, that we're dealing with here. It says that the floods came. And if you go to the beach and, and you take a, a, a bucket of, of, of water and, and you pour it onto the sand, like it compacts the sand a little bit, right? But, but for the most part, that, that sand absorbs the water that's there. And, and if you come back in a few moments, you can barely tell what you poured out right there in that moment. But that's not what we're dealing with here. You see, the consistency of this sand, of this, of this floor, of, of the desert of which Jesus would have been, when the water would have fallen, it would have mixed with this fine powder. My, my father-in-law was, was deployed in this part of the world with the military, and he said, he said you got to think of this sand, not as sand like we know, but almost like the consistency of a flower. So you take that flour, you add some water to it, you keep adding more and more water to it, and, and what used to be sand in that field, what we would think of, now turns more into like wet pottery clay. It's thick. Once you get on it, it, it it's difficult to work with. And within there, it's now not absorbing, but it's literally creating a sludge around you and the ground itself will feel like it moves. And as the floods came, the dried riverbeds that would have been around, had the big cracks that run through them, would have turned into raging rivers. Not just something that has water that's built up in it, but literally where, where you can see almost the effects of rapids have torn down through. A little bit different than just a regular Sunday afternoon rainstorm in the south. And then it says, and the winds blew. And the winds blew. So you've had the attack from the top. You've had attack from underneath. And we don't know how hard the winds blew. We don't know if it was the straw that broke or the mighty force of the momentum that pushed against that house. But the end results were the house on the rock stood and the house on the sand collapsed. We can come to the end of this parable 
and ask ourselves a question. A question that I've asked myself many times. Bo, are, are we doing the right things? We can look back at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount of what we've just seen and look through all the, all the topics that are there. We can have great moments of, of heart examination. Do I reflect as a person the, the, the standard that Jesus is communicating? Does my life mirror the standard that he has laid out before us? Do I think, do I believe, do I respond, do I react, do I speak, do I give, do I live in all of these ways? And I'm not saying that if we do this as a self-examination that that's incorrect or wrong. But what I would argue with us this morning is that it's incomplete. If I get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount and I look at this parable between the rich, I'm sorry, the wise builder and the foolish builder, and my only conclusion is, am I doing all of the right things, then my conclusion is incomplete. And here's why. When Jesus is, is teaching through the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to jump back to verse 21, chapter 7. Jesus is given a warning of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing in verse 15, but inwardly are wolves. He says you can see these people by their fruit, by who they are. We're not just looking at their actions, we're looking at the core of the individual. And then look at verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? and do mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Then Jesus tells the parable. That last Verse, verse 23, you've got individuals standing before Jesus saying, but look at all that we have done. But Jesus, on that day, in judgment, will look at them and declare to them, but I never knew you. I told you that I, I listened to a couple of books, actually in the process of, of finishing one while you're at the beach right now. Um, the book that I'm listening to right now is a book called Atomic Habits. Um, and I know there's probably a lot of you uh, that, that, have, that have read the book that I'm listening to. Um, or maybe you've listened to it as well, uh, and, and you probably got lots of thoughts on them, and I, and I would love to talk about those. It's written by a guy named James Clear, um, and, and I do want to say this. Uh, disclaimer number one, I just said I haven't finished the book yet, so uh, don't, don't ruin the ending for me. Right? Um, second, uh, I don't know if this guy is a follower of Jesus or not, um, but something that he said uh, at the very beginning of the book I think is, is extremely important because it speaks the, to the condition of humanity who's made in the image of their creator. 
it, it, it speaks to, to our condition of who we are in, 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 in being made in the image of our creator that connects us um, to, to Matthew 7. Um, and he said this, and, and I'm paraphrasing. He says, when, when creating positive habits, and that's how he describes it, um, when, when creating positive habits, uh, what you do comes from who you are. What you do comes from who you are. And, and he said, oftentimes we, we think that who you are comes from what you do, and that keeps us in a cycle of, of unproductive behavior. So here's this example that he gives. Uh, he says there's two people, um, and, and they both smoke. And so they're going to quit smoking. They, they, they roughly smoke about the same amount of cigarettes a day. They, they roughly have been smoking uh, the same amount of, of time. And they've, they've decided, you know, this isn't good for my body. And, and this is something I want to quit doing. And so one day at work, someone comes up to, to one of them and, and, and offers them a, a cigarette. And that person gives what I, what I thought would have been a great response. They say, no, thank you, I'm trying to quit smoking. What, what he says here is that in that moment, what that person does is they still identify themselves and identify with being a smoker. And he says, as long as that's the mindset, it will be harder for, for that person to break that habit that they desire. But the other person, remember, same amount of time, they've stopped smoking the same amount of time, like they've got, they've got the same struggle that they're carrying with this. Someone walks up to them and, and says, would you like a cigarette? And their response is, no, thank you, I don't smoke. What they've now done in that moment is they've attached their identity to who they are, who they would like to be. And he said, scientifically speaking, if you track through that person because of what they identify as, will be more likely to quit smoking. And here's what stood out to me. How you view yourself or where you find your identity or in whom you find your identity matters. The foolish builder says this house is the most important thing. This house is what I'm going to invest everything into. I want to make sure it's got the rooms. I want to make sure that it's got the walls. I'm going to make sure that it's got everything that it needs to do. And they pour all of their time, their energy, and their effort into the house. But the wise builder, the wise builder says, you know what? Man, that house is important. It's important for my wife. It's important for my kids. If this house is built well, it will provide generationally of what it needs to provide and take care of. There's great value in doing all of the things that needs to be done for this house. But the wise builder says, but the foundation that I put it on is the most important thing that I could do. The wise builder says, the rock of what's here, the foundation that all of this will be built on is the most important. Let's connect this with Jesus and judgment. In judgment, we, we will all stand before Jesus. And in judgment, there's going to be people who are in lines that stretch and stretch and stretch. And they're going to stand before Jesus. And they're going to say, look at it, Jesus. 
Look at the house that I've built. Look at the work that I've done. Look at the rules that I have followed. Look at what all I've accomplished. And Jesus, I did all of this for you. And his response will be, depart from me. I never knew you. How do you see yourself? Jesus is bringing these individuals on a journey of what a life surrendered to Christ looks like. I'm not saying that what Jesus says doesn't matter. It doesn't count that the standards of God's word aren't important. I'm saying the exact opposite of that. But the foundation of where it comes from is important. You see, the foolish builder, who was his foundation? Himself. Himself. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a person that says, Jesus, look at all I do for you? Or do you see yourself as someone who says, Jesus, look at all that you've done for me. And so all that I do for you comes from who I am in you. You see, we can fall into patterns of religious good enoughs. And Jesus says, but it's about this. Do you know me? This is a message that I think rings truest. Not in the world that we find ourselves but in the congregations in which we gather on a Sunday morning. You see, we can wake up every day and figure out our religious punch list of works that we do. And this is it founded on the rock? Is it founded on Christ? Do I know him, and does he know me? Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word. Jesus, my prayer for us today is the examination of of who we are. Not, not just an examination of what we do, but Lord, an examination of, of who we are in Christ. And Lord, through the power of your spirit, would you convict us? Lord, are we the foolish man building our house on the sand, setting up for ourselves the kingdom in which we determine the works in which we choose to do? Lord, are we the, the, the wise man who built his house on, on the rock? And in that time, in judgment, Lord, when we stand, it's not looking around and saying, but it had this type of walls and these type of doors and, 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 and this type of beams, Lord, but it, but it is looking and saying, no, 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 it, It's built on Christ. It's who he is. It's in the the, the wonderful work of the cross. It's in the power of the resurrection. It's in the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's walking in obedience with you as you work in us, as you change us, as you challenge us, Lord, to be more and more who we are. Yes, it is about not just not committing sin, but it's about hating the sin that's in our lives because 
we know that that sin cost you your life, Jesus, and it's God is not what you desire for us. God, so, for so long, so many of us have walked that line. And Jesus, look at the boxes that I check. Jesus, I do this for you. 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 Lord, your, your, your words in this sermon, when our identity is found in the things that we do, your words to us will be depart. I never So God, I pray, I pray that our identity would be found in you and in you alone. I pray that our identity would be found and that we were sinners who not needed to do better, but we were sinners who needed to be saved by the grace of God, by the work of the cross. That at the cross is found forgiveness. At the cross is found hope. At the cross is found grace. Lord, and through the work of the cross, where we are brought into a relationship with our Creator, where our sin is paid for, and we're joined with You, God, and we are made sons and daughters of the living God. And Lord, in the power of the resurrection. We will live here on this earth, but we will live for all of eternity because of who Christ is as he overcome death and the grave, and we can walk in the new life, which is Christ. And that, God, you give us your Holy Spirit, and so that, God, when we are obedient to you because of our relationship with you, Lord, it is evidence of the Holy Spirit at work within us which is why we come here and sing about your goodness and sing about your greatness. We don't come in here and sing about how good and how great we are. So God, I thank you that everything good, everything perfect is from above. It's from you. And God, if there is anyone here today standing on anything other than Christ. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they're taken off of their feet and they're brought to their knees. And then on their knees, they see their Savior, Jesus. And then soon your name we pray. Thanks again for listening, and be sure to check back next week for another episode. In the meantime, you can visit us at willowridgechurch.org or by searching for Willow Ridge Church on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.